asked him to share with us about how insurance actuaries can be the heroes of the post-pandemic recovery via behavioral science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gleb. Thank you very much, appreciate it. All right, everyone. Welcome to finally in live in-person audience. So that's lovely to see. It's great to see all of you and welcome to the virtual audience as well. Hello. <laughs> so let's talk about how you as actuaries can be the heroes of the post-pandemic recovery. Now, what I'll talk about are the typical problems that you run into when you try to convey and communicate about your risk management practices. You as actuaries are in the role in your companies, in your organizations, of being the chief risk management experts. And everyone else in your companies is going to be more oriented towards sales. You know, underwriters, obviously sales agents, and so on. So you have a difficult role of communicating risks to people who may not want to hear risks. And that's a huge pain point for actuaries. And I often work with actuaries to address these pain points. So that's what I'll be talking about. Why do we make decisions that are bad? Why do we ignore the wise information that you as actuaries are providing? And how you can address these problems? That's the shape of the presentation. We'll first talk about some of the problems, some of the reasons why people ignore your information, why people don't pay your attention, misinterpret, and make bad decisions. And then we'll talk about some ways of addressing these problems. So how do you avoid disasters? Now, you might have heard that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's a quote from Benjamin Franklin. And this refers to, oh, can somebody put the slides back up, please? Thank you. This refers to how you can take steps to address the problems because you provide the ounce of prevention that can prevent the pound of cure that you can address. So that's what we'll be focusing on, what you can do, and why people are making bad decisions that lead to disastrous situations. Situations that can seriously cause major problems for your organizations, your departments, and your career. All right. Let's see if we can get the slides back up. That would be helpful. Now, don't worry about it. It's not a huge deal. Not, you're not losing too much, but it would be helpful if we can get the slides back up. So let's talk about what you can do and why you're facing these challenges. Now, we're here in the Disneyland, the land of heroes, the land of magic. And I believe that you can become the heroes of the post-pandemic recovery. You can do it. Now, you are currently the unsung heroes in your organizations because you are managing risks. And that's not a comfortable place to be when other people don't want the risks to be managed. That's a problem for you. That's a problem for all actuaries, for all risk management professionals. Now, what you may not be realizing is that the reasons people don't want to manage risks is not because they're simply irrational or they're erratic, they're weird. The reasons have to do with the science of cognitive biases. You excel at data. That's where you excel. You excel at providing data-based research. You need to learn about how to manage people. And that's not an easy thing for actuaries to do. When you take your actuarial exams, it says nothing <laughs> about people management. That's not what your actuarial exams are like. But as you advance in your profession, as you become more in the fellow position, you get to learn that managing people <laughs> is your real job. Because at that level, you're having the technical expertise is necessary, but not sufficient. I see a lot of people nodding, people who have more experience, who have more gray hairs. You know what I'm talking about. Managing people becomes what you really need to do. And what you need to learn is why people are making these bad decisions. Now, we're in the land of Disney, so that is the land of magic. But here, we're going to be talking about the science, the science of why and how people make decisions. 
the behavioral science of why and how people's minds misinterpret data. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the best data you can provide will not be very useful. It will not be very helpful if people misinterpret your data. This is why you need to learn how to manage people. This is why you need to learn how to communicate with people effectively and how to convey your points in a way that their minds will not misinterpret the data. Because our minds are not really well set up for getting at the truth of reality. You need to learn about cognitive bias risks. And that's the science. How many of you have heard about cognitive biases? Raise your hand. Okay, I see about maybe 20 to 30% of you have heard about cognitive biases. That's good. So you'll probably have a background. You can maybe explain some of the stuff to people sitting around you. <laughs> so cognitive bias risks is something that unfortunately is not currently encompassed in your statistical risk management processes. Why is it not encompassed? Why are these risks which cause people to make bad decisions based on your reports, right? Your reports, your charitable reports, are aimed to help people make good decisions. But often that doesn't happen. So obviously there's a disconnect between the actuarial report that you present and the outcomes of these actuarial reports, of these analyses of your actuarial tables. And that happens because we have recent research showing that our minds are not aimed to interpret data correctly. But this research has only been coming out in the last decade, too, so it's not yet in your actuarial exams. It takes a very long time to change those actuarial exams, change that actuarial education. And that's why insurance companies and associations often hire me to come and speak and train and consult on these matters to you, actuaries, and other risk management professionals. So you can incorporate these cognitive biases into your risk management processes. That's the goal. That's what we want to achieve. Now, let's talk about this. And this is science, not magic. I remember that. So we'll talk about the science. You can trust it, and I'll, can, I'll be happy to send you more information, and you also have an opportunity to get a book, which CAS purchased for you. I'll be doing some book signings at the lunch break with the peer-reviewed research on this information. So you can take, check that out. Now, I'm going to ask you, which of these would you choose? So take a look at that. We have two ice creams. One that's 10% fat, and another that's 90% fat-free. So 10% fat or 90% fat-free. Now, look, imagine that you're going to be finishing this up after my presentation, the business meeting. You'll be going out to lunch, and there is some ice cream out there. How many of you would prefer something that's 90% fat-free? OK, lower your hands. How many would prefer the 10% fat? <laughs> all right. I think you can all see what the preference would be. We have about 95% of you or so preferring the 90% fat-free and 10%, 5% of you preferring the 10% fat. Now, you're actuaries. You know what the statistics are like. You know that 90% fat-free is the same as 10% fat, right? And 10% fat is the same as 90% fat-free. But 95% of you <laughs> would prefer the 90% fat-free, right? I'm telling you, this is not magic. This is science, even though it feels like magic. Why is that happening? What's going on in their minds? What's going on, more importantly, in the minds of your stakeholders that causes them to make bad decisions? So here's the thing that you're thinking about. This is about frame, how we frame something. The frames for which we see information determines how we interpret it. And there's cognitive bias specifically called the framing effects. What we see is really shaped by the framework in which it's presented. And so if you present information in one way, it's going to be seen as a positive. If you present it in another way, it's going to be seen as a negative. It's going to lead to different outcomes. So think about your actuarial report that you write. What does it do? That talks about the risks, that talks about the losses, that talks about the threats, that talks about the problems, right? Now, imagine if that actuarial report not simply emphasized the risks and problems, but also talked about the opportunities, the rewards, the gains. What would that look like? How would your stakeholders respond? 
Think about that. That's a really different style of writing a report. But just like saying 90% fat free is 10% fat, it would present the same information, just in a different way. So right now, are your stakeholders seeing the information you present as 10% risky or 90% risk free? How's that causing them to interpret your information? What's the outcome of their decisions? We can see what the information is like here. Can somebody turn down that music? Thank you. All right. So let's talk about, so that's the framing effect. And that's something for you to keep in mind, how that influences something. Let's talk about risk denialism. So I mentioned risk denialism. That's central to what we're talking about here. And we deny risks quite often. That's a problem for us, for our thinking. Everyone denies risks. You as actuaries are, have to be trained to not deny these risks. But intuitively, naturally, we deny risks. And that is called the ostrich effect, named after the myth that ostriches stick their head into the sand when they see a threat. Now, I'm sure you realize that's not actually what happens, because ostriches wouldn't survive very well <laughs> if they stuck their heads into the sand and if that was the reality. But that's what the ostrich effect is named after sticking your head into the sand of reality. We don't like hearing unpleasant information, information that feels bad to us. It's bad for us. We don't like to hear it. And so when we learn about threats, problems, and risks, unless we've been specifically trained, like you as actuaries have been trained to address this, we'll tend to have bad emotions about this and ignore information. So you need to learn how to frame the information correctly to your stakeholders. I need to learn how to address this risk denialism. That is critical for you as actuaries to succeed as you go up the chain of command, as you try to influence people, as you not simply work with other actuaries, but you work with underwriters, you work with product developers, you work with sales agents. That is really important for you to understand. That's what's going on here. Now, this happens at the top levels of organizations as well. So we're not simply talking about lower levels, but there was a really interesting study of 287, uh, 286 organizations that fired their CEOs, and there was 1,087 board members who were asked about the reasons. And the reasons, one of the top five reasons, over 20%, so over 23% in total, talked about risk denialism as the most critical problem. So risk denialism was the critical problem that led to these CEOs being fired. They denied negative information about reality. These are CEOs at the very top levels. And so you have to deal with these people. So the higher you go up the chain, the more you have to deal with these people. And you have to understand that and realize that. That's what's going on in people's heads. And of course, CEOs, leaders model everything for their followers. So risk denialism is one of the worst problems in organizations. What's going on here? Why do we deny risks? That has to do with our evolutionary heritage. Our gut intuitions, our reactions, are not well adapted for the modern world. The modern world, I mean, we're having a virtual audience, right? has really been around in the last decade with us being able to work virtually. The internet has been around since the 1990s. We have not had time to evolve. Our intuitions, our gut reactions, our emotions have not had time to evolve for the modern world. So that's a big problem for us. Because our ancestors have survived in the savanna environment due to two very important dynamics that you may know about. One is the fight-or-flight response, and another is strong tribalism. Now, the fight-or-flight response, you might have heard of that as a saber-toothed tiger response. It was very important for us to jump at 100 shadows in order to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger. We're the descendants of those who jumped at 100 shadows and got away from the saber-toothed tiger. So that's the fight-or-flight response. Now, tribalism, in that savanna environment, we lived in small tribes, weird, <laughs> of 50 people to 150 people. So small tribes of 50 people to 150 people, and we have to be very tribal in order to survive in that environment. 
meaning we had to look for people who look like us, who had their values, had our thought patterns. If we were not sufficiently tribal, well, we'd be kicked out of the tribe and we'd die. And if we weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes that were trying to take our own over our territory, well, we'd die as well. You notice we're the descendants of those people who didn't die. So we have a very strong tribal impulse. And that's part of basic human nature, gut reactions and intuitions. And those reactions were great for the savanna environment, but they're really problematic for the modern world. In the modern world, tribalism is a big, big problem. Think about the insurance organization in which you work. It's a huge organization, it's not a tribal organization. It has many different people in many different roles. And our global world is multipolar, complex. Tribalism is a bad fit for the modern world. And so is the fight or flight response. We have many less saber-toothed tigers around right now. We need to take the time to make complex, good analysis of risks and rewards. But that's not what our intuition tells us to do. So unless you've been specifically trained to address these intuitive responses, like you have been trained as actuaries, you will get into a lot of trouble with our intuitive responses. And that's why you see gut reactions leading to bad decisions all the time, and even CEOs being fired quite frequently for these reasons. So, what's going on here? The cognitive biases are the specific ways that our mind is miswired. It's a specific way that our mind goes wrong. And there are a number of them. We talked about the framing effect as one of them. And all of these, the ostrich effect is another of them. They are the specific ways that our mind is miswired, the specific ways that our thought patterns go wrong in the modern world. Now, I'll answer a question that many of you might be wondering as I'm here on the stage. Obviously, I have an accent, right? So many people want to know, hey, where are you from? I'll be happy to talk about it. So I'm from a little country called Moldova. It's right next to Ukraine. My dad is Ukrainian, so this is a really challenging time for me, given the war in Ukraine and that environment. I still have family in Kiev, uh, Vinitsa. Vinitsa is a small town in Ukraine where my family is from, and I still have family there. So my dad was from Ukraine, and he came to Moldova to marry my mom. Moldova is a small country to the southwest of Ukraine. You know, but people would not have known about it before this war. It's a very small country. And that's where I'm from. So I was born there in 1981, and my family moved to the United States in 1991, so when I was 10. And we settled in New York City. New York City is a cultural melting pot, as you might know. And so in New York City, I was pretty happy to live there, and I was especially happy in 1996, when there was a World Values Survey. The World Values Survey was about happiness, and it found that Moldova was the least happy country in the world of the ones surveyed. I don't know why. I was only 10 when I left, so can't tell. But that was really interesting and very made me especially glad that my parents left Moldova. My parents in New York City taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. And so in New York City, I, there were many accents around me, very cultural melting pot, so I chose to keep my accent and not drop my accent, as many people who move to other places in the country do choose to drop their accent because they want to fit in. And I didn't really need to fit in. It was a melting pot. And unfortunately, later, as I had my accent and I went out from New York City, I lived in Columbus, Ohio, that's where I live right now, and earlier I got my PhD at UNC Chapel Hill, I learned that I made kind of a dumb decision because of something called accent discrimination. So accent discrimination. It's a false perception that people who have a foreign accent are less trustworthy than people who don't have a foreign accent. So that's a false perception, but that's what it's there. That, that's how people intuitively feel on average, not everyone. But on average, there's a false perception. Now, there's one act foreign accent to which this doesn't apply. Can you guess what it is? British, that's right. They still have that cultural imperialism going for them. <laughs> now, 
Accent discrimination is one example of a pair of cognitive biases called the Horns effect and the Halo effect. The Horns effect and the Halo effect. The Horns effect refers to somebody having little horns. If you don't like one characteristic and you don't like it intuitively, it's not like you rationally think about it and don't like it. If it feels like this person is different from you in some significant way, like accent, appearance, culture, religion, background, we tend to not like that person as a whole. We tend to not trust that person as a whole if we don't like one significant thing about them. The halo effect is the opposite. It's like somebody has a little halo on their heads. If we like one characteristic of someone, their accent, their background, or so on, that causes us to like that person more as a whole. And this, of course, can be a problem for you when you try to address risk nihilism because it can cause serious horns effects. Now, I'll show you a video about, from a presentation I did a few years ago, I think it was in 2018. And as I mentioned, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. And Ohio, if uh, Columbus, Ohio, if people know anything about it, you know it as the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. OH, there you go. See, I know Buckeyes fans are here. <laughs> so, our big rivalry is the University of Michigan Wolverines. The University of Michigan Wolverines down the road, or up the road, and this is a huge football rivalry. So I was giving a closing keynote at the local regional CHIRM conference, so that's the HR conference, in Columbus, Ohio, to over, a, over 100 key, over 100 diversity inclusion professionals. So this was a diversity inclusion conference. And let's see what they will say when I ask them whether they would like to hire a University of Michigan fan. So, as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? Yo, oh, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, three people. Now, Out of over 100, three people. Regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices. <laughs> In Sorry. which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So, that's three people out of over 100. HR professionals. HR leaders of the Diversity Inclusion Conference. <laughs> that's who would hire a Michigan fan in Columbus, Ohio. So if you're a Michigan fan, <laughs> you know, don't come to Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> Sorry to say it. I gave them a chance to change their mind, and they didn't, wouldn't change their mind. It's a powerful, strong passion. So people feel strongly about this stuff. And that doesn't have anything to do with the traditional isms, race, religion, politics. It's about sports. And people are so passionate about this. And they don't realize what's going on intuitively. <laughs> uh, but when I ask them, clearly they're not going to hire that person. And so think about what's going on in your organizations. You're an actuary. What's the relationship between actuaries and underwriters, between actuaries and sales agents? There's natural and very strong horns effects because of the opposition in incentives with these roles and the kind of people who fill these roles. Of course, U.S. actuaries are focused on appropriate risk analysis, looking at with casualty, looking at various accidents, and putting people in the right buckets when you're evaluating the risks of potential revenue from them. Underwriters have an incentive to sell. They have an incentive to bring in new business. And so you'll see them artificially decreasing the prices for customers by putting them in the wrong bucket. And that's a big, big tension. Big, big challenge between actuaries and underwriters. And of course, with sale agents, it's even worse. So this sort of stuff breeds horns effects. And that is a big problem. In order to address that, you need to realign incentives. You need to create shared and aligned incentives with similar outcomes between actuarial groups 
and underwriter groups and sales groups. And so this is something that you need to think about how you would address. Let's talk about another cognitive bias, the confirmation bias. Now, unfortunately, our intuitions are to look for information that confirms our beliefs. If you've heard about any cognitive biases, it's the most famous one. We tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. So this is a big problem for us, that we don't like to hear this information and we don't like to look for this information. It feels for us good to be right, which means confirming our pre-existing beliefs. It feels bad to be wrong, and so we ignore the information instead of trying to disprove our beliefs. Now, if you think about it, how can you actually prove yourself right? You should try to disprove your beliefs. When you're doing an actuarial analysis, you look for information that disconfirms your beliefs as well as information that confirms your beliefs. But that's because you've been trained to do it. Most people have not. Most people have been tra trained on building a business case. What does building a business case mean? It means finding supporting information for your, uh, for your case. It does not mean trying to disconfirm your beliefs. Now think about this. What would you do and how can you help your stakeholders disconfirm their beliefs? How can you show them that this is the really valuable tool to make good decisions? That's what you need to be doing. You need to figure out, okay, how can I help them disconfirm their beliefs, not confirm their beliefs? And that's how you address the confirmation bias. Now, let's talk about another pair of biases. Now, start it with a picture. Now, how many of you see in this picture an old lady? Okay, Lori. How many of you see a young lady? All right. Now, let's take a look at this picture broken down. The optimism bias and the pessimism bias. You will see that this is a picture of both. And here's an emphasis. So in the first picture, you can see how this picture can be a picture of a young lady. So you'll see the nose, the cheek, the neck, and the elderly lady. You can see the wart, the nose, the eye. You see two people now, if you haven't before? Oh, see, oh, raise your hand if you see both people. Both, uh, okay. see the large majority of you do. You can turn to somebody next to you and ask for guidance if you don't. <laughs> I, I've had people who don't, so that's very easy. Now, what tends to happen is a reflection of the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. People who tend to see only the older woman tend to be people who are more pessimistic. People who tend to see the younger woman tend to be more optimistic. People, and by the way, if you think you're not pessimistic and you think you're realistic, you're pessimistic. <laughs> Don't call yourself a realist, please. That is a code name for a pessimist. <laughs> I know pessimism bias, just pessimism as an idea, has a negative connotation in our society, so people tend to call themselves realists. But if you call yourself a realist, just understand that you're a pessimist. <laughs> from the scientific definition. Now, optimism bias has a lot of benefits. It's people who are innovative, creative, cheerleader, motivator, they're entrepreneur, they're visionary. Unfortunately, it has some problems, like risk denialism, shiny new object syndrome. And I know this, I tend to be very optimistic, so that's my <laughs> predisposition on this range. By the way, it's not a binary, it's a range. People who are strongly pessimistic, people who are strongly optimistic, and there is a range in the middle. And I tend to be on the strongly optimistic front, which means I have 20 ideas before breakfast and it feels like they're all brilliant. I've learned to my bitter regret that they're not all brilliant. <laughs> you know, I have the shiny new object syndrome and risk blindness, and so do other people who are optimistic. People who are pessimistic have strengths and weaknesses as well. So the pessimism bias, you have strengths of improving, fixing things, maintaining, controlling. You are a devil's advocate, you're a manager, you're an improver. The risks associated with this are risk aversion and stagnation. So these are the two problems associated with pessimism. So the people who are more pessimistic, realistic. 
they really need two of, the, of each on your team, optimism and pessimism alike. So you need both. Why is that? Well, because the optimists are more visionary, they're more creative, they're more innovative, while the pessimists help improve these ideas. They provide skepticism and implementation. So for example, in my company, it's a six people company of consulting on the future of work, on these sorts of things, decision-making, cognitive biases. You know, it would feel very good for me to work with other optimists. I click with them, just like pessimists naturally click with other pessimists. But think about it, if we hired only after optimists, we'd have six people, we'd have 120 ideas before breakfast, and we'd be running in 120 different directions. That's not good. What I make sure to do is hire some pessimists, so I can hand them my 20 brilliant ideas, and they can tell me, well, these are all half-baked potatoes, and you know, maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And then they work on these ideas, they fix the flaws, and they implement the ideas. That's the strength of the pessimists. Now, people who are in actuarial roles tend to be more pessimistic, not all of them by far, but they tend to lean more on the pessimistic side. And may, that makes it a problem to work with people who are more optimistic, people who tend to go into the sales roles or the underwriter roles, if you don't appreciate each other's strengths. And so what you need to do is create a culture in your organization where both optimists and pessimists are appreciated. The optimists for generating ideas, for being innovative, the pessimists for keep, keeping people's feet on the ground, for fixing and in, the flaws of these innovative ideas, for implementing them. And the best way for people to work together is for optimists to generate ideas and pessimists to assess their risks, fix their flaws, shoot down ideas that aren't good, and implement ideas that are worthwhile. So that's how you address these kinds of problems. All right, let's play the next video. White, pass the ball. So players in white passing the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion. All right, so, where is your attention? We tend to pay attention to the most emotionally salient events, the most emotionally salient activities. And I want to check with you, how many of you saw the gorilla? Raise your hand. Okay, I see that about two thirds of you. And how many of you saw the player leaving the game? Raise your hand. See maybe about 15, 20%. Lower your hand. How many people saw the, uh, saw the color change of the curtain? Okay, one, two, three, like, 2%. <laughs> Anyone see all three? Okay, a couple of people, excellent. So it's very rare that people see all three, and that's kind of, you know, I was hoping that somebody in this room with the actuaries, detail-oriented folks, would see all three. <laughs> Good, that's very rare, right? I mean, and I do these keynotes also. So, we tend to pay attention to the most emotionally salient aspects of our environment. And when we're paying attention to the passes, you know, there's a gorilla, many of us will see it. Many of us will not. As you saw, about a third of us missed the gorilla. And it might be surprising to the two-thirds of you who didn't miss the gorilla. 
but that's what intuition happens. So and we're pulled to look at count the passes, right? But we tend to miss other things, like people leaving the team. So you might focus on, you know, big gorilla, maybe let's say insure tech entering your market. And you might miss the retention issues of people leaving your team. You might miss some background events that are happening with the curtain changing color. Maybe some pandemic starting up in the middle of nowhere, right? That has to do with our attention. And there's one of these cognitive biases is called the attentional bias. Attentional bias. We focus, as I said, on the most emotionally, what feels right to us, gut intuition, salient aspects of our environment, rather than on other factors. And we need to be cognizant of that. That's what happens to our stakeholders. We look for what confirms our beliefs. Optimists focusing on the positive, pessimists focusing on the negative, framing effect happens in the same way. So as you see, all of these cognitive biases feed into each other. Optimism bias connects with attentional bias, connects with framing effect. You have to understand them as part of a totality. There are over 100 of these cognitive biases, and of course I'm not going to go over 100. <laughs> I would do that in a full day session. But this is sufficient for you to get a sample of what these are like and how they feed into each other and they impact each other. So this is something that you really need to be thinking about. Where is the, your attention and where is the attention of your stakeholders? What are they focusing on? What's emphasized in their minds? When you give them your actuarial report, their eyes might glaze over parts that they don't want to see. And they might pay attention only to what they like to see. So how can you draw their attention? How can you frame it in a way that causes them to focus on what you want them to see? Maybe you can put some information in the front and some in the back. Maybe you can use highlighting. Maybe you can use boldening. Maybe you can use colorful notes, post-it notes, but also visual ways of communicating. And that's really important. That's been valuable for a number of actuaries whom I advised on this topic. So creating not only tables and reports, but creating graphs, creating charts. These things really help convey your information in a visually impactful way, which helps people communicate and accept the information better. So think about how you can communicate this information in a more effective manner to draw people's attention to what you want them to see. How do you get people to actually care about this stuff? How do you get them to think about cognitive biases? How do you get them to not deny risks? That's a challenge. But there are clear research-based ways. Again, this is not magic. We're here in Disneyland, but this is not magic as science. This is all research-based, and we have clear research-based ways of addressing these cognitive biases. So, you need to get emotional investment. Yourself and your stakeholders. You need to get people emotionally invested into caring about this stuff. Because just knowing about cognitive biases doesn't fix them. Think about your doctor. If your doctor told you to lose weight, would you do it? Just knowing about that you need to lose weight doesn't cause you magically to lose weight. You need to become emotionally invested in these issues. You need to care about them and you need to help people care. Because our decision making is overwhelmingly based on emotions. No matter how rational we think of ourselves, we still fundamentally make our decisions based on emotions. Actuaries do, underwriters do, sales agents do. No matter how rationally we think of ourselves, research clearly shows that over 90% of our decision making is stemming from our emotions and intuitions. So what we feel, rather than what we think. So, there are a couple of steps that you can take to address these cognitive biases. First, identify where you and your stakeholders fall into these mistakes. Second, recognize the pain points. How much pain and where is the pain caused? Then, develop a pre-commitment. So, commit yourself to addressing these pain points and then take research-based steps to address these problems. So these are the four things you need to be doing to help yourself and your stakeholders address these problems. Now, we've talked about a number of cognitive biases. We'll talk about some ways of solving them. But before talking about the solutions, I want you to treat the cognitive biases as a menu of options. You don't need to get overwhelmed and try to do everything at once. So don't take on too much at once. Choose the cognitive biases 
that you want to address. Treat it as a menu of options. So choose one that you think is important, and then decide the specific steps that you'll need to take to do it. And then proceed to other cognitive biases over time. Now, what has worked for other actuaries is to choose one cognitive bias and then think about, okay, what are three specific ways that this one cognitive bias has been hurting our department? So think about three specific instances over the last year or so. And then write about that in an email to your colleagues, your supervisor, say, hey, I've heard this really great opening keynote at the CAS spring meeting, and I think we should talk about this and address these problems. I want you to make a pre-commitment. You'll hear a lot of excellent information at this conference, so to make sure this doesn't slip your mind, make a pre-commitment and take the time right now to send an email to yourself, take some notes, whatever you need to do to calendar it into your system to address one cognitive bias, choose one cognitive bias, and decide that you will be addressing it. I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. So on your phone, whatever, write down what cognitive bias you'll address in the next week. So please take 30 seconds before we go forward on some of the solutions. All right, hopefully you've done that. You've decided on cognitive bias and you've sent that information to yourself that you'll be doing in the next week. Let's talk about ways of addressing these problems globally, not one by one. Now, I want you to take a look into your bag. Hopefully you have your bag with you. You should have my decision aid in your bag. So take a look at your bag. It should say five key questions for avoiding decision disasters. And let's go through these five key questions that you can ask and that you can help your stakeholders ask to avoid decision disasters. There'll be a double business size card. And one of the four sides will be these five key questions. Let's take a look at it, follow along with me. So first, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? Again, we tend to look for information that goes toward our beliefs. And so you want to look for information that disconfirms your beliefs. So what didn't you consider? You didn't consider information that goes against your intuition, that goes against your beliefs. So this is something you can use to help yourself and your stakeholders make better decisions by looking for information that they, they didn't yet fully consider. Second, what relevant cognitive biases didn't they yet address? So you've learned about a number of them and you'll have a chance to get a book with, that describes the 30 most dangerous ones for you as actuaries and other professional roles. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest they do? So think about somebody who is a senior member of CAS, somebody who is a mentor at your company. What would they suggest you do in this situation, that little angel on your shoulder? How have I addressed all the ways that this could fail? So addressing risks in advance is a very wise idea. Most people don't do it. So think about all the ways this could fail. When you're writing a report and handing it to someone, what, how can it fail? How can they be failed to take the decision that you want based on the report? Think about that and how you can revise the report in such a way as to address these cognitive biases. And finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What new information would cause you to change your mind? After we make a decision, we tend to stick to it unless we decide in advance that, hey, this is what would cause me to change my mind. Now, that's one thing I want to tell you about. The second thing is how to communicate effectively to risk deniers. We tend to use arguments and talk about facts and risks, but when somebody is denying obvious facts and risks, that tells you that emotions are at play. It won't work if you just keep repeating and arguing with people. So instead, what you want to assume is that there is emotional blocks at play, and you need to address their emotions. And addressing their emotions is an effective technique called EGRIP that talks about emotions, that's E-G-R-I-P, goals, rapport, information, and positive reinforcement. So, emotions. With emotions, what you need to do is figure out what they're feeling. What are your stakeholders feeling? When they deny obvious facts, they might be feeling anxiety, they might be feeling hope, they might be feeling anger, excitement. 
what are they feeling that are causing them to deny these risks? You want to deploy the empathy. How do you, what are their emotions? I'll try to understand how, what they're feeling. Their emotional pain points, their emotional blocks. That's first, that's the first step of eGroup. So you identify their emotions, then identify their goals. What are they seeking to achieve? What, how can you collaborate with them? Are you on the same team? We're all on the same team, so in the same company, you know, at the end we're trying to make a profit, right? So establish shared goals, you want to make a profit, you also want to have less stress and conflict in your workplace. What are you trying to achieve together? Put yourself in the same tribe. Appeal to that tribalism. Make sure that they are on the same side as you and they feel that they're on the same side as you. And then you build up rapport. You know their emotions, you know their goals. Talk to their emotions, speak to them. Show that you care about their interests, so that you care about their goals. Build trust. That's what you need to do in order for them to actually listen to you, to feel like you care about their interests, you understand their emotions. Now, after you get that rapport, so that's the fourth step, not the first step, that's when you can share challenging information that goes against their beliefs and it goes against their intuitions. And you want to be careful about this. So when you provide information that challenges their beliefs, frame it, you remember the framing effect, within your broad shared goals. Be careful about their emotional blocks, their pain points, and show how what they're thinking right now, what they're doing, what they're believing, is not really aligned with your goals, with your shared goals. And then you can address that information that challenges their beliefs. This is when you share the information. And finally, after you help them overcome their emotional blocks, their pain points, you give them positive reinforcement. That's the fourth step, that's the fifth step, and this is really important in order for them to have positive emotions about what you just shared, to fix it in their minds, and so that they also, you don't have to go through this laborious process in the future too much, so that they put more of a value on believing the facts, on believing the truth. That's eGrip. That is how you can get people on your side when they're obviously not believing in reality. Instead of arguing, instead of relying simply on facts and statistics. And again, this is not something that they told, tell you in actuarial school, don't teach you on the exam, but this is really important as you're going up your career. All right, so let's talk about finalizing this information. We have two final slides talking about how you can be the heroes of the post-COVID recovery by addressing cognitive bias risks. So, you currently have excellent data-driven risk management processes. That's what you excel at, that's why you're actuaries, right? But you need to complement that by addressing cognitive bias risks. Remember, this is only recently revealed information. This is something that's not currently incorporated into your risk management processes. It's not something that you're currently doing. And this is why I've been brought here to talk to you about it. This is something that you need to incorporate and it's only recently been discovered in the research. So, think about how the data you're providing to your stakeholders, it's your job to actually manage risks. It's not, your, it's not simply your job to provide the report, right? If you provide the report and it sits in a desk drawer somewhere, you have not really done your job. <laughs> you need to do your job by making sure that the data you provide, the risks, actually influence people. So you need to address those cognitive biases. To prevent them, people who are getting your data from making bad decisions, harming your organization, your department, your career. So protect yourself and your stakeholders by helping them have the right information presented in the right way to address cognitive bias risks. And you'll help your companies thrive in the post-COVID recovery, which is what this is all about. You will be the heroes. Now it's your turn to go out and make the magic happen. Take the next steps. You already have a pre-commitment, that you will do, so make sure to learn about these cognitive bias risks. You, this is again based on the science, not the magic, even though we're in Disneyland. And what will happen right now after the business meeting is that CAS brought a, a hundred copies of my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut, for you to have. I'll be signing them over lunch. So if you want, the, they're worth 20, 19.95 on Barnes & Noble or Amazon, so if you want, you can pick up a copy there, or you can go and get a signed copy for free 
over lunch. And I'll have 100 copies. So it's going to be the first 100 claimants. So the faster you make it, the more chance you have of getting a book. So I'll sign the first 100 copies. All right. I want to, you to come away from this presentation remembering that you will truly be the sung heroes of the post-COVID recovery. If you learn about these cognitive bias risks and how to address them, you, that way you'll position your company to survive and thrive in the post-COVID future and position yourself to excel in your career as you rise up the ranks and learn how to manage people effectively. Thank you very much. Mike. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. We have about three minutes left for Q&A. We have two aisle mics here. So if you can line up behind uh, the two aisle mics, we will take questions from the in-person audience. And we will also have questions taken from a live stream audience. So you will have people watching you. So uh, just be warned. So thank you. Um, I found it interesting that you mentioned uh, that denial risk was driven by our uh, evolutionary heritage. Uh, it was something that we needed to survive. I would have thought that catastrophizing would actually be the thing that would help people survive back in the day. So is making situations worse than they are or overemphasizing risk something that we need to be aware of? Or is that a good skill to have in the insurance world? So catastrophizing is something that will be characteristic of people with a very strong pessimism bias. So again, remember that range. So you have the pessimism bias, you have the optimism bias, and you have the people in the middle. From an evolutionary perspective, it was very beneficial for a tribe to have both pessimists and optimists. The optimists would be the folks who would go out, explore, find new resources. The pessimists would be the folks who would stay back and husband the resources that are available, and they would be the ones who the tribe relied on in tough times. So you need both. And the people who tend to catastrophize are, again, going to be just their personality type, going to be the highly pessimistic personality type. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thanks for your speech. So my question is, uh, in our society, ego, ego is a very large. Um, also, I think we, we tend to ignore ego, especially in, in politics and in the corporate world, you rarely, rarely see a leader say, oh, you know, I, I made a mistake and I'm, now I'm going to reverse course and uh, I'm a sorry I made the mistake. How do we deal with that in the corporate world and in just in general in our society? Right, so this is a big, big challenge. And again, actuaries are trained to address some of their intuitions. Leaders are not. They're taught to go with their gut. And that is a big, big problem for leaders. So this is why I talk about framing. You want to frame the information in such a way that the leaders don't perceive themselves to be wrong, don't perceive themselves to be bad, and you want to be careful about framing the information in such a way as actuaries often do, which is to highlight too much where leaders are making mistakes and they're falling into risks. So you want to look at people and see where their attention is going to be naturally drawn, and then draw their attention to where you want it to be drawn, rather than areas that cause them pain points. We talked about e-grip, right? The emotions, goals, rapport, information, positive reinforcement. The reason I tell people not to argue is because it tends to backfire. Leaders tend to dig in their heels when you're arguing. But if you use e-grip, that is a very effective technique that helps leaders appreciate and make better decisions. So I was working with, for example, I was doing some consulting project for a chief risk management uh, officer in a mid-size insurance company. And what happened there is that they wanted to incorporate cognitive bias risk management into their processes and systems. And so we were doing that, but in the meantime, the chief risk management officer found out that the chief underwriting officer was just about to approve an uh, insurance offering for a chain of buffet restaurants. Now, this was a time, this was about half uh, a year ago, and it still would be in the same time right now, the problem is that the approval was going to be at the same rate as before the pandemic. Now, if you think about buffet restaurants, they are a much, much riskier proposition now 
than they were before the pandemic. Obviously, their financial benefits are not nearly as good. They have a lot of problems. And so having the approval at the same insurance rate was placing their client in the wrong bucket. And so I talked to the chief underwriting officer about, hey, what's going on here? Just kind of looking, looking at the emotions. And I found that the chief underwriting officer really was focusing on making a profit and really was focusing on his legacy to the department. And he, want, he was going to retire in a couple of years. He wanted to make sure the department was left strong and he didn't really want to look at the, de-emphasize the risks and take a look at the losses. So what we talked about, I went through the e-grip process, I examined the emotions, I examined the goals to have a good legacy, and then I helped him realize that, hey, what we can do effectively is change the sales process to de-emphasize the more risky propositions like restaurants and hospitality, sorry, to the hotel here, and emphasize more consumer-oriented products for people who are staying at home, who are staying at work, and give them lower rates. And so by looking at that reframing and looking at, hey, how can he still succeed and survive? Because other insurance companies weren't entering that market very well. They weren't addressing these needs for that they can actually give insurance rates at a lower premium for the new consumer-oriented offerings for those who are working at home. The chief underwriting officer was pleased to pursue that direction instead of the more dangerous direction for the company. So by reframing the person's attention and using eGrip, that was an effective technique to address the ego that the chief underwriting officer was bringing to the table in making that bad decision. Thank you. You're very welcome. Hi. With the optimism bias and pessimism bias, you recommended balancing your team with at least two of each. Do you have recommendations on balancing exist existing teams? Can you repeat the last uh, uh, Do you have recommendations with balancing existing teams? I'm sorry, hard to hear you. Uh, with the optimism bias and okay. pessimism bias, you recommended having at least two of each on each team, yes. optimism and pessimism. Yes. Yep, on each team, so I didn't quite yeah. hear the each team. Exactly, uh, on each team, including actuarial teams, including under all sorts of teams, because, again, you have two people at least who are creative, who provide a vision, who provide entrepreneurialism, and you have at least two people who are improvement-oriented, who make, uh, who manage risks, who, man who address threats. Some teams, like R&D, are going to be more naturally a fit for having mostly optimists, but you definitely need at least two pessimists. And some teams, like actuarial teams, are going to be naturally a fit for having more pessimists, but having at least two optimists to be more creative, entrepreneurial, and visionary. But then with existing teams, do you have a recommendation on how to balance that if you're out of balance? Yeah, so if you are on an existing team and you don't have optimists and pessimists, you need some people to take on these roles. So you have some hats that people can wear and say, well, if I was an optimist, how would I approach this? If I was a pessimist, how would I approach this? That's a secondary option. I strongly recommend that you try to balance teams. So as you're creating teams, bring new people on the team and so on. But if you can't do that, they have people take on the role of optimists and pessimists and see, okay, from that perspective, how would we do it? So when I, when I do consulting projects which involve addressing some problems between actuaries and underwriters and sales agents, what I do for each group is before they come and interact with other groups, try to have them take on the roles of those groups. Okay, if you are an actuary, so I'm talking to underwriters, if you are an actuary, how would you respond to these ideas that you're proposing? And if you're an actuary, how would you, re if you think about for a team of actuaries, if you were an underwriter, how would you respond to that team? So having people put themselves in each other's shoes is a very helpful technique. Okay, appreciate it, thank you. You're very welcome. Hi. Hi. I'm the one who chose the old lady, so I'm a pessimist. <laughs> I work in a reinsurance company, so I see all bad things in the world, so I'm a pessimist, as realist, I mean. <laughs> So as a realist, I work with underwriters, brokers, claims people, just like many of you who are non-actuaries. And um, they're really good people. People, They're very good communicators. And I'm pretty sure they're aware of the cognitive bias much better than I do. So if I pretend I know their cognitive bias and try to be sort of manipulative or try to incorporate them and they see through it, what advice would you give us? So you're 
so you're asking how to influence people who are optimistic or pessimistic? I'm trying to make sure I understand you. How to get across my point beyond cognitive bias to people who already are aware of the cognitive bias, bias just like underwriters. So I'm a little bit hard to hear you from here. Oh, so again. Oh, sorry. Let me try to come up to you and hear you. Oh, I yeah, think there's absolutely. something with the mic uh, <laughs> positioning over there. Oh, thank you. Um, so I work with underwriters. Yes. Great people. I great people. People come to cater. Yes. How do I um, persuade them mm -hmm. using the beyond cognitive bias when mm -hmm. they are experts in cognitive bias? Okay. Good. Thank you. So the question is, you're working with underwriters, how do you persuade them effectively when you know that they tend to be more optimistic than you? Right. So what you want to do is, I talked about the actuarial report, right? And the actuarial tables. What you want to do is look at the positive information that you can convey, not simply the negative information, the risks and the losses. That's what typical actuaries convey, risks and losses, right? Focus on the positives, okay. So given that these are risks and losses, how can we make use of this beneficially for our customers, for sales? What can we do? How can we take advantage of this information? Just like with the chief underwriting officer. You know, we probably do not want to sell this insurance at the same premium to the buffet restaurants, but what we can do is focus on another piece of the market that is much more promising that other insurance agencies are not, prom are not focusing on. So you want to think about how you can convey the positives, not simply the negatives. Because what you don't want to see and what actuaries tend to be labeled as is Mr. No. You don't want that. You want to be say, not, you don't want to say, well, not this, but instead say, instead of that, let's go on this. Let's focus on this. So draw people's attention, what is going to be emotionally salient to them, to the most optimistic part, the positives of what you're reporting, and how they can take advantage of the positives, given the situation as it is. I'll work on it. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs> uh, so this is going to be our last question, and this is from the live streaming audience. How do you address seniority bias? Ah, so the people who have more authority, right? So with people who have more authority and they have, tend to have more expertise, they tend to be overconfident. They tend to think that, okay, I have seen all of this in the past. And they tend not to realize that the situation has changed and shifted. And their previous framing is not working out very well. So what you want to do is help them realize that the situation is fluid, the situation is dynamic, and how they can take a advantage of their learning, of their expertise, and look at, okay, here are the elements of the situation that are the same as they were before, but here are the new elements of the situation. Given that these are the new elements of the situation, what can we do to take advantage of your expertise, Mr. or Mrs. Senior person, given that this, these are the new elements? How can we shift that to, the new, to a new situation, given your expertise and knowledge? So help them realize that the situation is not the same as in the past, that their previous intuitions and tendencies are not going to work, but put them in the more privileged position of saying, okay, let's realize that these are the new elements, these are the new risks, these are the new threats, and these are the new opportunities. And given that, how can we take advantage of your expertise to make good decisions? So that's what I would strongly recommend with people who are more senior. Help them realize how the situation shifted, and the specific shifts, and then address those, and help them address those issues. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right, and I'll see a hundred of you at the book signing over lunch. Thank you very much. Please join me in another round of applause for our featured speaker, Dr. Gleb.